Church, are you ready to worship tonight? Welcome to First Wednesday. We're ready to worship. Put those hands together, everybody. Come on. Let's lift it up. Eyes wide. Eyes wide. I'm set on you. You made a road in the wild. I'm standing on ancient truth. I'm pressing on with my back to the
first Wednesday. Great to see you guys. So excited that you are absolutely here. Listen, we are going to have an incredible evening tonight. I'm going to tell you. I want to give you a thought. I want to make sure um, that we have, we, we got ourselves in, in the right position for tonight. Whatever you have brought in, whatever that is, a worry, a concern, maybe actually some of us came into the God's house with joy. You're meant to bring everything into the house of the Lord. You're meant to lay every single thing at his feet. You're meant to give him everything of concern or worry in your mind and in your heart. Because until you give him something, he can't transform it into something more that he wants for you. Sometimes we're holding on to things that we are, and God is waiting for us to hand him those things so that he can take them shape them, mold them, and guide them, and give them back to you in a way that is miraculous. That's something only God can do. So when you come into the house of God, expecting a good God, expecting a great Savior, expecting a miracle worker to do something in your life, he is faithful and able to do it. But we have to come expecting. We have to come expecting to hear his voice through his word. We have to come expecting that we're transformed through worship. We have to come expecting that God has something to say to us. We have to come expecting that what I give him, he will transform into what he wants with our lives. There's no contingency on how we come. It's just come. It's just come. Come to me who are weary, heavy burdened. I won't just give you rest and relaxation. I will give you a peace that can only come from the Prince of Peace. The worry is transformed when I give it to him to peace. Fear is turned to courage when I hand it to my Savior. Doubt is, is courageous now. And after the Lord touches it and takes it and transforms it. So at this first Wednesday, at this first Wednesday, and every time, church, we get together and we come to God, whether it's in personal devotion or whether it's collectively as a church, let's remember what I give him, he transforms. What I expect, I will absolutely get from a good, good father. Can I get an amen right there? So come on. I had to ask Pastor Jay. I like, do we have a song next? What am I doing? I get, I get so, I get so just I get so caught up. I get caught up in worship. And I have to worry about things. Let me tell you what we're gonna do. We got a special treat. While we're standing, uh, I want you to continue to welcome, if you were not here this weekend, to be blessed, blessed by my little brother. To be blessed by my friend, to be blessed by someone who understands the transforming power of a savior and to someone who understands what it means to bring in the privilege to communicate the word of God. You're in for a treat tonight. You're in for a treat. Can we put our hands together? Can we give a warm chapel welcome again? to Pastor Monte Dillard. Chapel! Somebody give Jesus some praise in here tonight. Come on.
Let the whole church say amen. You may be seated in the presence of God if you can. Would you all help me celebrate your pastor, Pastor Q? Would you make some noise? <laughs> he is quite special. He is no ordinary pastor. The grace on his life is so tremendous. And we also celebrate his lovely bride. The pastor's wife is here, Lady Trish. God bless you. Come on, would you clap your hands? So thankful, and I'm so thankful to have traveling with me my wife. Tina is here. Wave your hand, love. <laughs> and uh, so thankful to be here. I've had an amazing, amazing uh, time here sharing this weekend and uh, sharing uh, with some of you in uh, conversation. It truly has been a, uh, a tremendous blessing, and uh, we will go home much better than we came having been in your presence. Give yourselves a hand, chapel. Thank you all so much. Would you pray with me, please? God, our Father, we are so thankful and appreciative that every morning that we rise, there are new mercies we receive. And now, though you were merciful yesterday and the day before that, and though you touched and was with us all weekend, God, we needed a fresh and a new tonight. And I am asking that the words of my mouth and that the meditations of my heart, that they would be acceptable in your sight. And furthermore, I pray for the hearts and the hearing of all of those who will hear your word tonight, that we would be transformed by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Tonight, I'd like to share with you from 1 Samuel. I am enthralled, <laughs> even after many years of preaching, pastoring, and being a son of God through Jesus Christ with the life of David. And um, I, uh, I want to share tonight with you all from 1 Samuel 30. The Samuels and the Chronicles, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Chronicles, are somewhat synoptic, similar to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, both giving accounts of, um, of the lives of, of, of the Israelites, particularly under David's rule. And uh, I always urge you to, to find great uh, exploration in the life of David. Tonight, I'd like to talk from 1 Samuel chapter 30, uh, verses 1 through 8. And they say these words from the King James Version of the Bible. And it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and had smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but they did kidnap them, carried them away and went on their way. Verse 3, so David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captives. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite, or former wife of Nabal the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people, his own people, spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man, for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Verse 7, and David said to Abiathar the priest, Ahimelech's son, I pray thee, bring me hither the ephod. And Abiathar brought thither the ephod to David. Last verse. And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And shall I go? And the Lord answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them and without fail, recover all. Chapel, tonight for the time that has been allotted to me, I'd like to speak to you from the subject, the instinct of inquiry. The instinct, excuse me, 
to inquire. The instinct to inquire. Changing my own subject. The instinct to inquire. One of the uh, life's greatest challenges, particularly in the Christian faith, is that we often have to live in the tension. And really, we live in the tension of many things, but specifically, we often have to find ourselves and manage uh, the great challenges that are associated with living in the tension between these two areas, God's ability and God's activity. God's ability. The preacher tells you every week, God can do anything. There's nothing that limits him, nothing that can stop him. Then on the other side of your life, you see God's ability and you're trying to figure out if he can, why hasn't he? And in that space in between God's ability and God's activity, there is tension because we are trying to figure out if God can, why has he not yet? And one of the greatest, one of the greatest things that we have been given to manage that tension between God's ability and God's activity is trust. Everybody say trust. It is imperative that if we are going to be successful at faith, at commitment to Christ, at trusting him, at seeing things through to the end, at letting God be God, there are times when we are walking and living in that which is ambiguous. And when you can't see, you must continue to trust that though you don't have it all figured out, you don't have all of the details, or maybe even that some things have happened that you would have preferred they not, you have to trust that God is yet in control. Though he had many struggles, and oh, did David have some struggles, one thing he knew how to do, one thing we can glean and learn from him tonight is that he knew how to trust God. This is why, one of the reasons I believe that David in spite of all of his challenges, was called a man after God's own heart. He was called that in spite of his proclivities. I love 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. We always talk about verse 2, and David was on the roof and saw Bathsheba bathing. You know the verse before that says, In the springtime, when kings go to war, David the king sent Joab, the commander of the army, with his army, and David stayed at home. And then David was walking on the roof. He should not have even been home. It's not even my subject tonight, but have you ever been somewhere you weren't supposed to be? <laughs> in spite of all of those challenges, he knew how to trust him, especially in his darkest time. This text, 1 Samuel 30, we find David in a very strange place. David is running from his own king, Saul. He has temporarily found safety amongst the Philistines. You do know he killed their giant. Isn't it strange that in one season, those who were enemies, God will make a refuge? He goes to fight Israel with the Philistines. But some of the commanders of the Philistines were not comfortable, so they urged Achish to send David and his 600 men back to Ziklag, the city that he had given them to live in, in the land of the Philistines. En route back, a few miles off, they see plumes of smoke billowing in the air and realize that the city that they left their wives, sons, and daughter's end is on fire. Can you see it? These 600 tough men break out in a mad dash to get back to Ziklag, realizing that though on one hand there are no dead bodies and there's wives and sons and daughters are still alive, the reality, the dark reality comes to them that they have been taken captive. We see that the men get so distressed that they themselves talk about stoning 
David, verse 6, and David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. They spake of killing him. He is running from the Israelites. He has been rejected by the Philistines. And now his own army that he has amassed is talking about stoning him. He's so distressed, the scripture says that he encouraged himself in the Lord and does something very strange. He says to Abiathar, the high priest, bring me the ephod that I may go and inquire of the Lord. If you have any Old Testament understanding, you know that the responsibility of prayer was for Levitical priests, those born from the tribe of Levi. David is from the tribe of Judah. He needed God so bad he wanted to break the rules. Here's where it gets real hairy so I don't put you to sleep. And David inquired at the Lord <laughs> and said, shall I pursue? Your wife and children have been taken captive and you think it's a good idea to go and ask God if you can go and get them? Do you have an instinct to ask God first? Or do you feel like there are some things that just make sense? The men have just threatened his life and they look at David and say, when are we going to get our wives and children? And David says, I have to ask God first, can we go? Chapel, I got a question for you tonight. Do you trust God that much? Whew. Here's the problem. And David inquired at the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Here's the problem with asking questions. He might say yes. But he also might say no. David trusted God so much that he was willing to live with whatever the answer was. Chapel, can I ask you a question? What if God would have said no? David would have had to get up from the altar praying, go look 600 halfway saved men. No, read 1 Samuel 22. You will find that David got these guys when he was hiding in the cave of Adullam. And the Bible says all men that were in debt, distressed, and discomforted, and struggling came to David. The Lord sent him all the misfits. And they just threatened him. And he says... So what are you doing in your life that you just assume God wants you to do? Is your instinct to inquire first? Let me take you to Sunday school. Trust in the Lord, oh God, with all thine heart. Help me, church. Lean not unto thine own. Your understanding says it's a good idea. Your understanding thinks that it's a good thing to do. But until you have inquired of the Lord and said, Lord, shall I pursue? Is this opportunity mine? Is this promotion mine? Is this mine? You should not take one step without inquiring 
And David trusted God with his life because he would have rather went and told these 600 men no with God's grace on him than pursued after his family without God's grace anywhere near. And the problem is too many of us think we just know what God is saying and we haven't made time to inquire. If you want it tonight, say, Lord. Come on, say it louder. Say, Lord, help my instinct to be to inquire first. If you believe God is helping you tonight, I dare you shout like you know God is moving in your life. What do we need to ask God for? This, this verse led me to some questions. The complexity of this, look at these questions. I got to go, I got to go. How long was David in prayer? See, we read, we read it too fast. And David prayed and God said, you know in between David prayed and God said, there was some time. Okay, you don't believe me? Does God answer you in 30 seconds? <laughs> How many days was he in there? The men are pounding on the door of the temple saying, come out of there. I want my family back. And David is saying, I do too. But until God says yes, I will not get up off of my knees. Second question, how long did it take God to reply? Now, the God I serve ain't in nobody's rush. And David waited. Look at the third question. What were the Wasser names doing <laughs> while David was praying and waiting? And he did not let any of it move him because his instinct was first ask God, are you going to go with me? And until I know that, I will, I love my wives, I love my children, but I would do them justice trying to pursue their rescue without the assurance that God's hand is on this. Do you have an instinct to inquire or is prayer your backup plan? The last resort after your will and your way didn't work. And so David shows us that if we are going to do this, we must trust him. And David, verse 8, inquired at the Lord saying, shall, who shall I pursue? And shall I overtake them? Three things tonight that I want to leave with you. If you are going to live a life where your instinct is to inquire first. Number one class, David shows us that you have to break yourself. Break yourself, boo. <laughs> I told myself all day, do not say that after you do. <laughs> I had to. I, I just, it felt like God was telling me to. I don't know. I don't know. It just felt right. Everybody say, break yourself. We love us. And we love our way. And we love what we think we know. But if you are going to walk with Jesus, if you are going to see maximum results, David showed us, I know how to fight. I have men that know how to fight. And if we go, I'm sure we could whoop them, but I'm not leaning on myself. I'm going to break myself from my dependence on me. I love in John 11, Jesus was quite sarcastic at times. Jesus come, the one whom you love is sick. Four days later, Jesus shows up, and Mary and Martha have an attitude. <laughs> if you had been here, Jesus said, I just thought y'all wanted me to know he was sick. You never asked me to come right away. 
And sometimes we either consciously or subconsciously think that we know more than him and we have to break ourselves from our own will. Sometimes we let the intellect he gave us block us from trusting him like we're supposed to. Somebody say, Lord Jesus, help me to break myself. And David inquired at the Lord saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? Not only should you break yourself. Number two class, this is my favorite point tonight. You have to brace yourself. Oh, Pastor Dillard, why should I brace myself? You must brace yourself for whatever his answer who God is going to be. Pastor Jamal Bryant tweets this, it is very difficult to hear the voice of God when you go to him having already determined what it is you want. <laughs> and if you are going to inquire of the Lord, you need to brace yourself because very commonly God will say something different than that which you plan. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord that determines his path. And when David asked the question, knowing that this might not be the answer that I'm hoping for, but I trust that whatever his answer is, oh God, anybody want to live like that? Lord, I trust that whatever your answer is, that it's best. And, uh, and David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And God answered him, pursue. Whoo, God. I'm going to get happy tonight. Y'all pray for me right here. He be, shows us that you must behave yourself. Excuse me. That you must. Uh, that's number three. Let me just go on and say it. <laughs> behave yourself. Hey, whatever God says he wants you to do, Lord God, I need somebody right there. Do that and nothing else. Chapel, I came to tell you tonight that if you would inquire of the Lord, if you would seek him and ask him, he will give you direction, he will give you answers, he will give you insight, and I would implore you to behave yourself according to what he has said and what he has said alone, because whatever he says do is where your grace and your strength and your success is. I wish I had somebody that knows I did not make this up. Is there anybody that has seen this happen in their lives before? And you know, you know that wherever God says go is the best place for you. And so you must break yourself. Who, oh God, break your own will. It seemed obvious. Didn't it seem obvious? But David shows us that your instinct must be to inquire. Then you have to brace yourself for whatever his answer is going to be because since his ways are above our ways and his thoughts are above our thoughts, it is likely that whatever you wanted, God is going to do something more than even that. And thirdly, I leave you with this fourth grade class. Behave yourself. And whatever God gives a green light to do, do that and that alone because that is where your grace is. I feel a prophetic release tonight, chapel. Can I give it to you? The Lord told me to tell you the answer is yes. If you receive your yes tonight, I want you to lift up a praise unto God because he is saying to you, pursue and without fail, you shall overtake it. Oh, God, thank you, Jesus. Verse 8 says, pursue and without fail, 
you shall overtake it. And whatever you have before the Lord, I prophesy in Jesus' name tonight that you would get a yes from God, a green light from God, double favor from God, because you trusted him first, and now God is going to show you what happens when you trust him. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever, to behold the beauty of the Lord, here it is, and to inquire, hallelujah, in his temple. Would you jump on your feet, give God a shout of praise, because God is about to say yes in your life, Hallelujah. He's changing my instinct. Come on, speak that over yourself. He's changing my instinct. He's changing my instinct. And my instinct will be to inquire. Can I tell you that he hath blessed you in heavenly realms, Paul tells the church at Ephesus, past tense. But you got to know where he wants you to go. You got to know what he wants you to do. And until you've inquired, even at the times when it seems obvious, what do we have to pray for, David? We got swords, we are skilled, and we see the trail. It's time to go. But David said, unless the Lord tells me that his hand is on this, I will not go. Can I pray for you before I leave? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take, help me church, him at his word, and just to rest upon his promise, just to the saith the Lord. Come on, let's get it. And Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Sing it, church. Jesus, Jesus, pray. Jesus, oh, for grace to trust. I want to sing the chorus one more time. Jesus, Jesus, come on, sing it. Jesus, yeah. Father God, in Jesus' name, tonight I believe that divinely you are shifting our instincts, that we are coming out of lives where we lean on our own understanding, where we are getting to a place via the example of King David, that even in situations that are traumatic, though they appear to be obvious, let our instinct be to inquire first and foremost. Let us ward off the pressure that we're sure David was feeling from the men. Pray for what? We know what we need to do. Let's just go. But until, until, until you have said, my grace is with you, my hand is with you, until you have given us the green light, pursue 
without failing, you shall overcome. Father, let us stay committed to our inquiry, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. That is what we thank you for. So tonight, I release upon you the power of the spirit of the living God that we will break ourselves from dependency on our will and our knowledge, even our experience. They all play a part. They are all good and they are all necessary, but they are not that which we should depend on primarily. Lord, let us brace ourselves because oftentimes your answer is very different than what we prefer. Lord, help us to behave ourselves. That that which you say and that alone be that which we do. And we will see miracles. We will see signs. We will see wonders. We will see victory. And we will be overcomers. In Jesus' name we pray. Chapel, lift up a praise and wake the neighbors up with a shout unto Jesus. God bless you.
just rest right here for a moment. God, we believe you're powerful tonight. Lord, we know you're powerful. We know that you're still making a way. And so, Lord, we say yes to what you're doing in our lives. We receive what you've spoken in this place tonight. Come on, let's just welcome him in right now, right where you are, with your hands lifted all over this place, with our hearts set on him. We've heard a word tonight. God, we receive tonight. We receive tonight, Lord. We respond. Oh, so powerful. We need you, we need you. You are powerful, God above. 